mute yourself so that we don't have to compete with children in the background or in the foreground for the minute. Um, and, uh, Great. So it's my honor to introduce to you today Shada Rabapur. So Shada is a postdoctoral fellow working in my lab at the Douglas. She received her bachelor and master's of science degrees in neuroscience from McGill University and her PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Ottawa, working for Dr. Patrick Davidson and teams at UCLA, Yale, and Florida State University. Her research investigates factors that influence memory and cognition, as well as interventions that may help optimize cognitive function with aid. Today, she's gonna to talk to you about some work she's been doing with me um, related to the Prevent AD cohort and um, looking at the task fMRI data from that cohort. Her work has been supported by funding from agencies such as NSERC and the FRSQ, and she's currently an FRSQ postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Um, Jada is also a passionate science communicator and has published her book named How Not to Train the Brain, which was published by Oxford University Press. So thank you, Shada, for agreeing to give this talk, and I look forward to hearing it. Thanks. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, like Dr. Raja mentioned, I am uh, going to be talking about uh, memory-related brain function in older adults uh, from the PREVENT AD cohort, so all of whom have family history of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and just, oh, is this going to work? No, this is not working. Sorry, where is my PowerPoint? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so just to give an overview of my talk, I'm gonna give a little bit of a background on episodic memory and how it evolves in aging and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then I'll jump into the work that I've been doing with the Prevent AD cohort, uh, which is a longitudinal cohort, but I'll be focusing uh, for this, the, the current analyses, I'll be focusing on the baseline uh, data, looking at two specific risk factors, um, specifically the APOE uh, allele and uh, the influence of biological sex. Uh, so cognitive function changes with age, um, and this happens also in healthy aging. There's a little bit of a decline that can be expected. Uh, and this decline becomes a lot more pronounced with conditions like Alzheimer's disease and prodromes, including mild cognitive impairments. Um, but before any uh, behavioral or clinically relevant signs appear, there's a, a period of many years, uh, 10 to 20 years is estimated, where there are uh, neural changes that start to develop, um, bef again, before any uh, behavioral indices show. And this is a, an opportune time for us to study the development of Alzheimer's disease at the neural level, and also ideally to intervene. And uh, it, during this period, uh, one of the most um, interesting systems to look at is the episodic memory system, which is one of the first behavioral signs of Alzheimer's disease, one of the first uh, signs to appear. Um, so uh, just to give a little bit of a, an overview on episodic memory, so this refers to our memory of past personal events uh, in its contextual detail. And there are different phases of uh, episodic memory. So uh, when we're forming these uh, memories, when we're experiencing the event um, in, in the specific context, this is called the encoding phase. Um, and then as we maintain and consolidate this memory over time, we get a memory store that can be accessed later on uh, in a phase called retrieval. And um, retrieval of these memories has also a uh, distinction. So there's a sort of general sense of familiarity when we uh, remember uh, or have a sense of, of knowing that we've seen something before or experienced something before, uh, and then um, have uh, associative um, context, context uh, memory that gives us a sense of recollection. So knowing uh, exactly uh, what happened, wh where, you, where you were when this happened, or, or what the source was, the location was. Um, so, so kind of in brief, uh, object recognition is sort of a general sense of familiarity or knowing, and recollection is understanding or, or remembering all the contextual details associated with a past event. Um, and a lot of people kind of see this as a serial process where um, you first start to, you, you first have a sense of familiarity and then sort of retrieve the associative details and have a sense of recollection finally. And these can be distinguished. Hey, Shada, can yeah. I just ask you to hold your, your mic away from your body because I feel like it's maybe, it's, it's creating a lot of like um, static. Oh, sorry. Um, That's okay. I might, maybe, maybe that won't help, but hopefully it will. Okay, I'll try to move my hair. I don't know how to move it away. Is that better or still? Uh, slightly. 
Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll try to hold it like this. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, episodic memory retrieval processes can be distinguished at the behavioral level. Um, so uh, can, can see a difference in familiarity and recollection, and these can be tested in different ways. Uh, so typically, uh, studies have used a stepwise process to uh, study whether you remember an item, so yes, no, and if yes, if you remember the surround context, so uh, what was the source, where did you see this object or experience this event, and then often are paired with a confidence judgment, so uh, how confident are you in your response. Um, and often we see this pretty standard two by two uh, grid where uh, an old item that was correctly identified as old is uh, labeled a hit. A new item that was correctly identified as new is called a correct rejection. Uh, and then if there are mistakes, if a new item was incorrectly labeled as old, we call that a false alarm. And uh, an old item that was incorrectly labeled as new is called a miss. Um, these dissociations in uh, recall or familiarity versus uh, recognition sorry, recall, uh, recollection versus recognition or familiarity, um, can be dissociated at the neural level and most prominently in the medial temporal lobe. Uh, so uh, typically anterior regions of the medial temporal lobe, like the perirhinal cortex, have been more strongly associated with a sense of familiarity or recognition, where posterior regions of the medial temporal lobe have been associated with recall, including uh, the hippocampus. Um, and this is just to show that, um, so this double dissociation can also be associated with confidence judgments. So uh, for example, in the posterior hippocampus um, and uh, parahippocampal cortex, for example, if you're looking uh, in this panel here, um, more strong uh, judgments of old um, are more strongly associated with activations in hippocampus and uh, parahippocampal cortex, uh, respectively. And this, also, this distinction can also be found for novelty detection. We can also look at this beyond the medial temporal lobe, so regions including the posterior midline, left parietal cortex, and prefrontal cortex have also been associated uh, with uh, distinctions in uh, recollection, familiarity, and novelty detection, and are also uh, similarly associated with elements uh, of confidence in old versus new uh, rating. Um, and uh, we can also use these dissociations to study changes in episodic memory that occur across the lifespan. Uh, so performance-wise, uh, again, healthy, even in healthy aging, there's an expected decrease in episodic memory performance um, in uh, recollection, as well as in familiarity. So this is sort of uh, the standard uh, new judgment without any context. Um, and also in the response times associated with these uh, performance metrics. What I want to point out is there's often a steeper decline in uh, the memory of contextual details compared to general sense of recognition, which is relatively more preserved in healthy aging. Um, and these can be associated with uh, br um, brain activation patterns. And so in this study, which was done by uh, uh, Dr. Raja and some of her colleagues, um, we see that in young adults, there's a correlation between memory performance and uh, these brain regions labeled here, whereas um, these regions are not, as, uh, are, are not correlated with performance in older adults. And in fact, in this study, older adults were also uh, performing at a lower, uh, at, at a lower rate. Uh, so so these, these regions that were supporting good performance in young adults were not mapping onto performance in older adults who have deficit in uh, particularly in source memory. Um, and of course you can detect declines as well in uh, Alzheimer's disease and in particular um, deficits start to appear in recognition memory not just in context memory when you're looking at pathological groups. Um, and similarly these can be mapped onto brain activation patterns uh, both at the encoding phase as well as the retrieval phase again in, in recognition in particular. Um, so, so here we'll just see uh, between healthy older adults, uh, patients with MCI and patients with al Alzheimer's disease, changes in, um, in, the, in the encoding phase relative deactivations or in recognition relative hyperactivations compared to healthy controls. And you can see in some cases there's sort of a gradient-like manner where um, there's a progression from healthy aging to MCI to Alzheimer's disease. Um, 
And uh, finally, even in people who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease, so healthy, uh, healthy adults who do not, again, have any uh, indices of pathology, but do have risk factors, including family history or um, genetic risk factors, including an APOE4 allele, um, do show differences in activation. So in this study um, done uh, by some of my colleagues uh, in, in Dr. Raj's lab and others, um, we see a dissociation in uh, healthy controls and controls who have only family history of Alzheimer's disease compared to people who were at highest risk who had both family history and an APOE4 allele. Um, so here you see that um, the, the regions in these gray bars are mapping onto uh, red um, regions shown here, whereas in the bottom, uh, uh, bottom associations, it's mapping onto the blue regions. And what I want to point out in this study, too, is that all participants were uh, middle-aged. So uh, the, these changes can actually be detected before, uh, before the period of older adulthood, which is what we typically study. Um, so this brings us to the work that we've done, uh, so looking at episodic memory-related brain function in the prevent AD cohort. So again, given that changes in episodic memory and associated brain activity can be detected earlier than old adulthood, so as early as middle age, in the absence of clinical symptomatology, uh, we wanted to look at how risk factors, uh, including family history and APOE4 allele and biological sex, can contribute to these changes. Um, so just an overview of the PREVENT AD cohort, it's a bit of a busy slide, um, but essentially these are all older adults uh, who were uh, 60 years of age or older or 55 if, were, uh, if they were uh, recruited within 15 years of their parents' um, Alzheimer's disease onset, but otherwise were cognitively healthy and had good general health. Um, and no other medical conditions. And again, I just want to point out that in these analyses, I'm focusing on the fMRI task, um, uh, task fMRI data. Uh, so the task itself uh, had an encoding and retrieval phase, and we were specifically interested in looking at source recollection versus general item uh, recognition or familiarity. Uh, so the encoding phase included 48 stimuli, uh, asked participants to remember if an object was, uh, oh, sorry, just to indicate if an object was presented in the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen, um, kind of like this on the bottom, you see the response options. And then uh, after about 20 minutes, there was a retrieval phase where participants again saw the same 48 old items, um, but also 48 new stimuli, so 96 in total, um, and had to respond if the object was familiar if the object was on the left previously, if the object was on the right, or if the object is new. Uh, so it's a four choice uh, force response in one step that participants had to do. Um, so I wanna uh, also just remind how we uh, act, um, measure performance. So in this typical condition, you would see, uh, again, hits, correct rejections, false alarms, and misses if you were just looking at an old new distinction. But in our task, um, we had old left, old right, or old new as possible correct response options. Um, and possible responses in all were old left, old right, familiar, if they didn't remember the source, or new. And so what we labeled a correct source hit would be if somebody correctly remembered if an old item was uh, on the left or on the right. If participants uh, remembered that an object was was old, but made a mistake with respect to what, uh, where the source was, so what, where it was on the screen previously, we called that a source misattribution. If participants saw, uh, re recalled that the object was old, uh, but they did not remember the source, we, we, and, and so indicated familiar, we called that a recognition trial. Um, and if uh, participants remembered that it was new, uh, we called that a correct rejection. In terms of the Erroneous trials, um, if, if a participant labeled something new that was old, that was called a miss as, uh, as, as traditional. Um, and same thing, if a new object was labeled as old or familiar, um, we called that false alarms. Um, and these percentages here are just showing the chance levels. Um, so this is, this is how we calculate a chance um, for, for uh, each correct uh, option. And the other uh, calculation we made was uh, to correct for bias. So um, this would be, th these measures would be akin to D prime. So typically D prime calculation looks at standardized hits minus standardized false alarms. 
And in our case, because we had um, the additional layer of left or right source, we wanted to make the distinction between correct source recall versus correct recognition. So the way that we calculated bias corrected source recall was looking at standardized source hits, so these cases here, minus standardized source misattribution, so these cases here, and we call that probability of source, or B source. Um, and similarly for recognition, um, we looked at the recognition trials and uh, calculated the standardized uh, recognition trials minus standardized false alarm trials. So all these trials here and call that probability of recognition or P-recog. Um, the way that we analyzed the brain activation data was using partial least squares. So I'll just go through a very quick overview. Um, so this is a multivariate approach that allows to identify whole brain patterns of activity as they co-vary across time. Um, across task conditions and between groups. Um, so in task PLS, what we're looking at is um, the brain activation levels and um, basically looking at um, what most strongly co-varies with, uh, with one, what, sorry, what patterns in one matrix most strongly co-vary with a pattern in another matrix. And in behavioral PLS, we can look at the added um, value of a, of a behavior vector. So how does task-related brain activity correlate with a behavioral vector of interest, which in our case was these P source and P recognition metrics. Um, in PLS, signif significance is assessed uh, through permutation tests um, to see if latent variables that arise are significantly different from noise. And the precision or stability of estimates is through bootstrapping. So looking at how reliable is uh, an answer that emerges. And this is kind of what it looks like uh, depicted um, uh, with, with images. So you basically stack um, your, your different groups um, then by task events. So in our case, the encoding of uh, subsequently remembered source the encoding of subsequently recognized items and the retrieval of source uh, memory versus recognition. Um, in the case of BPLS, you add your performance metric um, and then you get uh, the covariance matrix and through singular value decomposition, you get a singular value which represents how, how representative um, or how much variance is accounted for by a latent variable. Uh, then brain saliences or weights and then uh, design saliences or correlation profiles. So in the case of task PLS, we're looking at design saliences, um, which essentially show bars that um, are reflective of the levels of activation, whereas in behavior PLS, we see correlation profiles, uh, so positive or negative correlations. And these are interpreted along with the brain salience. So uh, blue areas represent negative salience areas, whereas yellow and red uh, areas represent positive salience areas. So in uh, the first study uh, that's currently uh, undergoing revisions, um, we looked at the influence of having an APOE4 allele in, uh, in our prevent AB cohort. Um, so we wanted to examine brain behavior relationships during uh, episodic encoding and retrieval based on APOE4 status over and above the influence of family history. And, and why do I say that? Because all of the participants in prevent AD do have family history of Alzheimer's. Um, and we hypothesized that we would see differences in brain behavior correlations in carriers versus non-carriers at both source recall and recognition. But in particular, uh, again, because recognition memory is uh, additionally uh, impaired in, in pathology, we thought we might start to see deficits in recognition in uh, APOE4 carrier, carriers relative to non-carriers. Um, and finally, we thought that these differences would not be restricted to medial temporal lobe regions. Okay, so just to look at our uh, demographics. Um, so uh, we, we had um, more or less uh, the same sample. The, the one difference that did appear was age. And I wanna point out that this is after uh, removing age outliers um, and uh, otherwise years of education and estimated years to symptom onset was the same. Uh, the way that we calculated estimated years to symptom, op symptom onset is um, essentially a difference between the participant's current age and the age at which their parents were first diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So about 10 years out from when their parents were diagnosed. Okay. Um, because of this significant age difference, uh, we did account uh, uh, for age as a covariate in all our subsequent analyses. Um, so looking at neuropsych results, uh, again, the two samples were more or less comparable. 
uh, although we did find uh, a significant difference in MOCA performance where actually the APOE4 carriers were performing slightly better. So it's less than a point difference and they are both uh, above the cutoff, uh, but this was nevertheless significant. Um, and we looked into this a little bit further. Um, we actually saw that there was sort of this um, non-significant trend um, for, for uh, you know, across, across the lifespan basically for, um, or across the lifespan, across the age spectrum in our sample um, for uh, carriers to be performing slightly better than non-carriers. Um, they also had comparable performance on our episodic memory task. Uh, again, here you can sort of see a, a non-significant trend where the carriers tend to be performing slightly better, but again, this is non-significant, both when you look at uh, the raw metrics as well as our calculated uh, probability of source and probability of recognition. Here what's interesting, so again, we mapped it across uh, the age range of our subjects, and you see in the recognition category, um, there seems to be a trend where uh, carriers are performing slightly better uh, at younger, in younger ages, um, and then slightly worse in older ages. But again, this was not significant. Um, we also looked at response times, and we found that they were comparable across uh, both groups and in all categories. And what was interesting is that we saw um, this, this sort of general pattern of um, uh, fastest response for correct rejections and correct source identifications, and slowest for false alarms and recognition trials. Um, then looking at the task TLS, we found two significant latent variables. The first one, which uh, sort of showed a difference between encoding versus retrieval. Um, so if you look at the bars here, um, if you see these downward bars are, are correlated with the negative salient areas. So these blue areas here um, are uh, associated with um, encoding both of source and recognition, whereas these positive uh, uh, upward bars are associated with positive salience regions, so these broad um, yellow and red regions here. Um, so specifically, uh, we saw that these positive salience regions, which we're mapping onto retrieval, include the bilateral claustrum, cingulate gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus, and precuneus, as well as the left middle frontal gyrus. And the negative regions include left uh, ventromedial, um, anterior cingulate orbifrontal, and lateral middle, middle temple, temporal cortex. Um, the second latent variable uh, was uh, distinguishing source recollection versus item recognition. So again, you see here, um, the negative salience areas are mapping onto uh, source recollection um, and positive regions mapping onto um, uh, uh, so, uh, item recognition. Um, and these include the middle occipital, inferior parietal lobule, caudate, temporal gyri, left hippocampus, and right hippocampus in the case of um, negative salience regions. And for recognition, uh, positive salience regions, bilateral inferior frontal gyrus, cingulate gyrus, left middle frontal gyrus, and right inferior parietal lobule. Um, and looking at the brain behavior correlations with the behavior PLS, um, we found a group difference in this case in the correlations both at encode, encoding and source retrieval. Um, so in particular, we saw that these positive regions, so um, here in the, shown in the black bars, um, positive correlation between these, um, between uh, positive uh, APOE4 carriers and uh, these yellow or red regions here, which include the right thalamus, right supramarginal gyrus, and left insula. Um, but in non-carriers, especially for the encoding of subsequently recognized trials, um, the areas that were mapped for non-carriers include the bilateral occipitotemporal cortices, the uncus, caudate, and anterior me medial prefrontal cortex, and left parahippocampal gyrus. Um, so I'm just showing you these correlations in a hopefully more clear way. Essentially, the takeaway from here is that um, there are different mappings of carriers and non-carriers particularly at the encoding of subsequently recognized uh, trials. Um, so one thing that sort of taking these results together, one thing that we noticed right away is that um, the recognition patterns um, or, or the areas that we're associating with recognition versus recall aren't necessarily um, what, what some of the literature has shown, for example, in the parahippocampal uh, cortex. And so uh, taking these areas and the response patterns together, we noticed that because we, we are seeing faster response times for correct source compared to recognition, 
Um, in this case, we might be thinking of recognition as a failure of source memory. So rather than thinking of it as a sequential process where first um, we, we sort of have a sense of familiarity and then associate um, the contextual details to finally get a source recall, in this case, participants might actually have been searching for the sor source context of the object and then only if they failed to do so, selected familiarity or, or maybe had a false alarm um, and, and that would uh, sort of correspond with these response times that we're seeing here. So in the second study that uh, we're, uh, we have just embarked on, so uh, these are kind of fresh results that we're still thinking about, um, we wanted to look at sex differences uh, in the same cohort. Um, and because one of the, um, uh, yeah, actually, go on. Um, so, so because one of the biggest risk factors of Alzheimer's is women, um, uh, th this is something that we were interested in. And in, in particular, women represent more than 65% of late onset Alzheimer's cases in the United States. Um, and globally, uh, there's a higher incidence, prevalence, and age standardized death rate in women compared to men. Um, you can also see these differences in cognitive function and brain volume. So if you look at uh, healthy older women, uh, typically their, their episodic memory performance is higher than men. So if you see in both cases here in this particular task, but the decline becomes steeper. So women with Alzheimer's disease tend to have lower uh, performance than men with Alzheimer's disease. And the similar patterns can be seen with brain volume. So uh, at lower um, amyloid beta levels or higher uh, DSF tau levels, women show a steeper decline in hippocampal volume compared to men. Um, so this brings us to uh, what we wanted to explore, which was, again, the brain behavior relationships during episodic encoding and retrieval uh, based on self-reported biological sex. Um, so we looked at, the, at an age and education match sample from the baseline data of the Prevent AD cohort, particularly because we had a limiting uh, factor of, of uh, number of males. So we had, in our original sample, we had 125 women compared to only 41 men. Uh, so we wanted to balance this out in our current analyses. And we anticipated that we would see differences in, in brain behavior correlations. Um, and in particular, we, we thought that we might see uh, differences uh, because in our exploratory analysis of the sample, we were already seeing some, uh, some changes in, uh, or some differences in women versus men. So um, just to show the, uh, the, the demographics again, um, so we, we selected a sample of 41 women to match the 41 men based on age and education, and the, the matching worked out quite well. They were also matched in BMI, as well as, again, estimated years to symptom onset. Um, and looking at their performance across the board, again, more or less comparable, but here we found again that women tended to be slightly better uh, at the MOCA than men, although both, uh, again, above cutoff of, of uh, 26, which is the clinical cutoff. Um, they tended to have comparable performance, although uh, women tended to be slightly better performing across the board. Um, and in this case, if you look particularly at our P source metric, women appear to be performing better, um, although this was uh, not significant. And similarly for, for response time, so we were seeing overall the same patterns where the fastest responses were for correct rejections and correct source recall and slowest for recognitions and false, uh, false alarm trials. Uh, but here also in all response categories, we actually saw that women were responding faster compared to men, uh, except for in false alarms. But uh, otherwise across the board, women seem to be performing faster. Um, when we looked at task PLS, uh, we found very much the same patterns as we had in our uh, baseline sample. So uh, first latent variable that was mapping encoding versus retrieval in uh, largely the same areas. Um, and the second LV that was looking at uh, source versus um, recognition. Again, uh, very similar areas. What was interesting was um, the behavior PLS, <clears throat> excuse me, in the first significant uh, latent variable, we found uh, preferential er areas that were preferentially mapping on in women compared to men. Um, so if you look here, all these um, bars for most conditions are significant and almost significant at encoding source. Um, are mapping onto women, but not significant in men. Here, this, this also crosses the zero, which is not very visible because it's black. Um, 
so in particular, we found that the, there was a negative correlation between successful retrieval performance and negative salience regions in women. So uh, again, all the salience regions that we found were negative salience regions seen here in blue. Um, and so this positive uh, bar uh, shows that it, uh, or suggests that it's a negative correlation with these negative salience regions. Um, and in particular, we, we saw uh, activity in uh, bi or correlations with bilateral inferior frontal, superior temporal, uh, middle occipital temporal gyrus um, and cingulate, as well as the left fusiform area and the right medial frontal and percunius. Um, and again, I wanted to point out that there was no correlation in men. Um, so this is sort of showing it a little bit more clearly again, same uh, correlation patterns. And in our second uh, BPLS, we actually saw a sex by phase interaction, particularly for source memory, where we found that um, there was a negative correlation between performance and negative salience regions during source encoding in women, so women here in gray, um, and the, the same negative correlation was apparent during source retrieval in men. So uh, essentially these, oops, oh, yeah. these regions, um, including the bilateral claustrum, left cingulate, medial and superior frontal gyrus, and the right anterior cingulate, superior middle frontal gyrus, as well as the pecunius, um, were differentially active at different phases for uh, men compared to women. Um, so just to conclude, um, we found overall that episodic memory performance was more or less comparable across APOE4 and sex. Um, based on our patterns of results, uh, both uh, in response times and some of the uh, brain uh, regions that were becoming active, uh, we might consider that recognition, at least in this task, was more of a failure of source recall. And we also found across the board slightly higher performance in APOE4 carriers as well as in women. Um, we also found that APOE4 and sex may differentially influence episodic brain behavior correlations rather than task-related activity. So again, we found um, similarities in task activation both in men and women as well as in APOE4 carriers and non-carriers. Um, but uh, when we look at the combination of brain activation with performance, there, that's where we start to see distinctions between our two groups. Um, and we, we think in particular in the case of uh, APOE4, um, the differences in the reliance on brain regions for encoding of objects that were subsequently recognized uh, or uh, sort, uh, source recall was happening, we think that this might be uh, a difference in approach or strategy use. Um, also, activity in frontal and parietal regions uh, was associated, again, with source encoding in women compared to source retrieval in men. So uh, together, these sort of reflect that risk factors like APOE4 and sex may influence a distinction in the associations between performance and brain activity rather than the activation patterns themselves. So, so the, the areas that support memory in men versus women and carriers versus non-carriers appear to be different although they, they, uh, there's no distinction, at least at this stage, in performance or task activation broadly. Um, so some of the questions that we're more interested in exploring further are uh, how uh, activation levels compare in particular regions of interest in men versus women, um, and whether we might be able to detect differences at the network level, and how um, these, uh, these risk factors might interact with other factors. Uh, so for example, in the context of um, uh, uh, reserve, we might be looking at things like uh, education and occupation. Uh, we also have information about CSF, uh, tau, and amyloid data that might be interesting to look at in future uh, analyses. Uh, and finally, we are interested in uh, looking how these patterns change or whether or not they hold longitudinally. Um, and uh, we can do that in this, in this cohort at uh, 12 and 24 months. So that's something that we're hoping to embark on. And uh, that's it. And I want to thank uh, all the members of the Raja Lab, and in particular, my collaborators on these analyses, as well as uh, the members of the Stop 80 Center, uh, who have been very helpful. That's it. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, Shida. That's an excellent talk. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, if you want to raise your hand, or uh, you can chat me the question, and I'll read it out to everyone. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind getting started. So in your first study, mm -hmm. when I look at your um, the chance attribution in that matrix that you showed, Let me see. is that 
does that play into your PLS results at all? No, no. So um, this is and just kind of, sorry. And should it? Because so, you know, I mean, like performance. You know, you, when you when you create your cross correlation matrix as an input, a performance won't be. You know, it's it's not equally attributable to. To every condition, right? Yeah, so, so there's two things uh, that I actually forgot to mention. So, uh, uh, well, one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, across the board, we, we only selected um, uh, uh, response or participants who had at least um, eight uh, correct trials in, in each category, uh, just for to have the sufficient sample or sufficient numbers. Um, but then in, in particular, in looking at the bias corrections, um, I think that's, that's where we account for um, uh, a tendency to, to answer, um, you know, preferentially for old versus new. Um, so, so that's how we took that into account. Um, but also, if you look at the percentages of, um, well, <laughs> it's all, the performance results are later on, but um, uh, basically what we saw is that they were much higher than chance. The, the actual performance numbers were much higher than what you would expect um, just at chance level. So those are sort of the two considerations. Right. Does that answer the question? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Sylvia, do you have a question? Yep, I do. Um, so, I mean, it seems that for the APOE, you, your results are not going in the sense that you expected. So do you have any idea of why that might be the case or? So, so yeah, there was a number of uh, things that we, that we talked about um, or, or thought about when we were looking at these. Um, so, so one of the things is that um, at the end of the day, these sample are healthy older adults. Um, and if you look at the estimated years to symptom onset, they're still relatively far away. They still have about 10 years uh, before the age that their parents um, were diagnosed. So um, there, were, there were two things that we thought about um, and that actually reviewers brought up in, in our review process. Is one is that uh, it's possible that in this particular sample, we're seeing a survival effect. So we're, we're seeing um, you know, APOE4 carriers that are performing better because again, prevent AD takes out uh, people who are starting to show symptoms of MCI and, and of course uh, Alzheimer's disease. So that's one possibility. The other possibility um, uh, is that, so, so there are some theories that show that APOE4 is preferentially, uh, or sorry, is differentially um, influencing memory at different stages of life. So in earlier stages of life, so young adulthood, uh, some studies actually show an improved performance in people with APOE4 uh, carrier, who are APOE4 carriers, compared to later in life where um, you start to see deficits in, in carriers. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to make that claim because these are all older adults, of course. Um, but one thing that we thought is, again, because they're still several years away from when their parents were diagnosed, we might be seeing sort of a transitory phase. Because performance wasn't that different across the groups. Um, and, but you're, you're still sort of seeing trends that carriers are performing slightly better. So, so, so yeah, those are the two things that we thought of. Either it's a you know, particularity of the sample or we're sort of witnessing this transitory phase if indeed APOE4 does have this paradoxical effect at different stages of life. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think it's why it's going to be super interesting actually to look at what's happening longitudinally because yeah. so all the data that you, you took, I guess, were at baseline, right? At all of them, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, now, like, since we have follow-up data on them, then uh, we start to see decline in some of them. I mean, one other question, if there's no more, is there another question before I ask another one? Go ahead. Um, I wanted to make a comment with the, if, if, we, if we can continue that point. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The so third interpretation, Shada, uh, this is Veronique Bobat, by the way, hi. Hi. Very nice talk. Um, a third you. interpretation could be that APOE4 carriers are, diff are using a different memory system, right? Because yes. we, we found that um, E4 carriers that use their caudate nucleus, or no, let me, let me go back. People who use their caudate nucleus could be faster and more efficient on certain tasks. And then we have another study showing that E4 carriers who use their caudate nucleus could be perfectly normal, healthy, cognitively normal and still have atrophy in the hippocampus. So it could be a, a question of brain systems being used. Yeah, absolutely. And I think our, resort, our results support that when we saw in the BPLS, there was uh, a different mapping for carriers versus non-carriers. So I think that's, that's definitely an interpretation as well. Yeah, exactly. So that's absolutely. all I wanted to say, Sylvia. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so, but we know though that in the Prevent AD, the APOE for care, at least at baseline, they do perform a little bit differently, which I guess kind of fits with all, uh, all these answers, but it seems that they, yeah, they, they are kind of a bit better. If I remember right, they are a little bit further also to their estimated years of answer. Yes. So, yes. That's also a good a point. Bit, Not significantly, yeah. but yes, slightly. I yeah. can bring that up. Um, yeah. Another question that I have for you. So, I mean, you know, I like the design about you know, uh, looking at the data in a very clean way. Um, however, I mean, there's so much data there, you know, like, so there's about like 350 participants that did the task. Have you thought about looking at the old sample while correcting for some of the confound? So for example, like not excluding the one with age that were like not excluding the older one, but adding age as a covariate and then taking advantage of the full sample, which would allow you to maybe check for, you know, age, um, sorry, not age, but APOE and sex interaction, because I believe that we think that it's more APOE for women that are at increased risk, so kind of merging these two projects together. Um, okay, so you're, you're thinking along the same lines as us. Uh, so we, we are hoping, and we have actually started to do some uh, APOE followed by sex analyses. The limiting, the limiting factor though, um, so yes, like you mentioned, there are over 300 people who've done the task fMRI, but unfortunately, when we take out um, people who have uh, genes that we're not interested in, so an E2 or 4-4 um, uh, allele, for example, uh, and also account for performance, so having enough trials for us to analyze, and also taking account clean fMRI data, that really cuts down the sample to um, under 200. Um, and then the, the uh, age outliers that we took out were just a handful. So I don't think that really makes a difference. So the sample that we actually studied in the end was 165. I don't think we can get any more than that at baseline. Um, and uh, I guess obviously not in the longitudinal either. Um, and then uh, we, we were still thinking about how to best analyze sex by APOE4 interaction because again, the limiting factor really is sample, sample size. Um, so if we look at the age matched sample, we start to get less than 20, 20 cases per, per, uh, per cell. Um, but if we don't look at the age match sample, if we look at the full sample, then we have a very strong imbalance of women to men. So it would be 125 women, I think, to 41 men. Um, so, so we are starting to do these analyses, at least in an exploratory way. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's any way that we can um, bolster the sample size in this cohort. Thank you. Aurélie, uh, do you want to mention your, um, um, mention your, do you want to ask a question or do you want me to just read it out? I'll just read it out. Um, so Aurélie mentions that uh, Angelique Gonneau's paper, uh, as well as a study she did, um, we saw that APOE4 carriers had less atrophy in the hippocampus. So could that explain your findings? Yeah, um, I think, I think, um, I mean, it's something that we'd have to probably look into more, um, like do follow-up analyses on this. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think that sort of plays into these hypotheses of how APOE4 is really affecting um, brain function and and uh, brain volume as well, and how that interplays with um, with the development of Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, memory-related pathologies. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I can't really comment more, uh, but I, I do think that that could be a possible uh, consideration. So thank you for bringing that up. Are there other questions? Um, so I've got another question. The, in, in the subjects that you triaged based on performance, are they any different anatomically or functionally other than their task, like their task performance? Kind of to Sylvia's previous question. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. Um, so if we look at performance, I, I did one of my earliest analyses was just looking at performance without considering um, fMRI and uh, the, the numbers match up. So the numbers, if you look at more than the 165, I don't remember exactly what the number would have been, but if you look at more than the 165 sample uh, at the performance level only, um, hit rates, for example, are comparable. Uh, pr they're pretty high uh, overall. Um, but um, I, I mean, yeah, there's just some data that we can't we, we mentioned that there's a bunch of people who need, you need to have eight correct responses minimum to be included, right? Uh, well, eight, um, eight, eight uh, events per e in each response category, sorry. So, so at least eight um, correct source, at least uh, eight recognitions, at least eight false alarms. So not necessarily correct responses, eight, eight responses in each category. Sorry. Okay, so, so you have some variance across. Yes, the, yes, yes. So, uh, sorry if I <laughs> missed. Okay. 
Okay. But wait, then I'm confused. So what about if someone is super good and then doing like yeah, all so right, that person would be excluded? Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, if we wouldn't be able to consider, um, re yeah, exactly. We wouldn't be able to consider like recognition, for example, because they would only have source hits. But shouldn't your PLS take care of that theoretically anyways? Like why would you, why would you, why would you prune the data that much? Especially when you have such limited data sets and you're looking at a gene by performance interaction. I, th I think you, you need to have that for the, to, to, to be able to have enough, um, like, to, like you can't you can't look at um at a recognition like like retrieval of recognition even at the task level at task activation level if there were no recognitions retrieved. Like, but then you know you I mean? can... because we're we're comparing the four conditions we're looking at um the encoding of uh, the encoding and retrieval of source compared to recognition like we're we're trying to parse these conditions and and so you you need to have them to begin with <laughs> to, like okay so then. All these people, like like Sylvia said, if someone is doing everything right and you have no, and you have no errors, are those individuals younger, older, more male, more female? I mean, there, like, I think in reality, I think theoretically, obviously, that's important to look at. I think in reality, um, I'd have to go back, but I I think there were maybe like a, a couple at most that we had to exclude for that reason. Um, I'd have to go back and check. So so. I mean, it, it wasn't, I don't think it would significantly contribute to, to the results because it's not like, we, it's not like we, we excluded 50 people because they were all performing super well. But I think, no, but, I, but, but both ways, right? Because I think yeah, I exactly. want some variance then, you know, if, if everyone is kind of, if you, if the best one are excluded, then, then the worst one are excluded, then you have this sample that is very similar to each other. So then your chance to find differences will be reduced. So Right, but at the performance, like if you just look at the behavior, um, when you do include these people too, the the response patterns aren't different. So, so I agree, you can include them. You can include their brain activation uh, as part of the task PLS, for example. But, but then there's no way of doing the analysis that we did because they wouldn't like they wouldn't contribute to some of the response categories that we're looking at. Right, I something to think about. I think so. Okay. I, I'm. I just. You know, hopefully you're not, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that the sample is, is so homogeneous that at one point there's no way you can find differences. So, but, but there is still a variance. Like we do see, even within our prune sample, we, we do still see a variance in, in all our response categories. Like I can, um, yeah, like the, there, there is still quite, quite a bit of a variance. I, I don't think that's the issue. And again, I don't think we um, I have to go back and check the numbers exactly, but we didn't exclude that many people on that basis either. So I, I don't, I, I, it's, it's definitely an important question and an important consideration, but I, I don't actually think it would be contributing to a big difference in what we, in the patterns we'd be seeing. I mean, like, I, like for example, in your recognition, your source misattribution, and even your false alarms, like I only see variance in your hits. I see very little in the other three plots, for example, by comparison. That might be a scale issue. Well, the other thing is um, there, there were a lot, like there were a lot more um, source hits than, than recognition. So, so um, again, because it's a four, it's a four response, like force choice. Um, so people are, are hoping to get or trying to get source hits. So, so if you get a recognition, it's only if you weren't able to identify source. Um, and so that might partially explain um, like why we're seeing so many more sources because that's, that is what people were trying to do. That was the task. Cool. Any other maybe, questions? Well, maybe on that graph. So, and then why did you exclude the two, like the three, two? Like did, would it have been interested to look at, you know, kind of the two, three, and then the four, four, just to see, I mean, the two, two, I guess are supposed to be better. I think the and samples the four, were four. so low in those categories that it wouldn't have made sense to include them as a separate category. Um, so again, yeah, just a handful of them. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I mean, theoretically it would have been very interesting to look. All right. Well, I'll let you guys, let's unmute everyone. Let's see. And, uh, Give some applause for Shay's great talk. Thanks a lot, Shay. Thank Much you. Thank you. Thanks for comments.